Keep on standing. Keep on standing if you don't mind. Um, I love the verse that says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. Nothing in us that uh, was beautiful, but he looked beyond our faults, and he saw who we could be. Amen. I'm, I'm going to read my text real quick because if I don't read it now, I'm not sure I'm going to get to it. And um, I want you, if you have your Bibles or your phones, uh, you can go with me to Romans chapter 4. This is one of my all-time favorite passages of Scripture. Romans, the fourth chapter. And I'm going to read through verse 21. As it is written... I have made thee, I'm not going to, I have made thee a father of many nations, not just Israel, before him whom he believed, even God, and this is the part that I really want to preach on today, who quickens the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were who against hope, or when there was nothing to hope for, believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations. It's interesting because the Lord says, I have done it. And it says here, he's believing that he might be the father of what God says already exists. According to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. You realize that faith came out of a womb that was dead? Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He staggered not. He didn't get drunk on unbelief. He staggered not. The, the weight of unbelief didn't weigh him down, but he was strong in faith. How? Because he's giving glory to God. Being fully persuaded that what he had promised, what God had promised, he was also able to perform. You can be seated. I'm not sure where we're going with this today, um, but this week I began to really feel the Spirit of the Lord speak to me. He said, I am creating things that have not existed in preparation for what I'm getting ready to have my people do. And he said, I am also resurrecting things in the spirit that have been dead. There are things that God is doing right now in the atmosphere that we cannot see. And it's the nature of God. When you go back to the book of Genesis, the first chapter, it begins to talk about that the earth has been trashed by the devil. Because we know that when God creates things, when he gets done, he looks at it, he goes, that's good. He did not originally create the earth in a state of being messed up. We don't know how far back in time before Adam that God created the earth that we're on. Uh, scientists through carbon dating and different things, there's a lot of debate. Some people believe that the earth is only 6,000 years old. But when God spoke to Adam, he said, replenish the earth. And so I do not believe the earth is just 6,000 years old because it was beautiful in its splendor and God cast Lucifer out of heaven. Now, 
That's not something to die for all right there, okay? It's not a doctrine. It's just how we perceive things that God tells us in the scriptures. But I believe that when the Lord casts Lucifer out of heaven and sent him to the earth, he landed on an earth that was beautiful and pristine. And then the scripture says that the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the earth because God was not there where the devil was. And so when the Lord got ready to create man in his own image and in his own likeness, And to give him dominion over the earth. God will never settle for the devil ruling over something that he has created. The only way that can happen is if we give the enemy the right to do it. But the Lord will never ever settle for the enemy to rule over yours and mine's life. When we give ourselves to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the scripture says that. It is the heart of God to raise up men, children like himself. And so what God begins to do before Adam ever comes on the scene is God begins to create. Adam doesn't know what God's doing. He is not in existence yet. He is not aware of the presence of God. But God sees Adam while he's saying, let there be light. Everything that God's doing, he's doing in anticipation because he's got a son coming that he wants to be blessed. He's thinking, I wonder if he'll like this. And I'm going to shape that just like that. And I'm going to make that particular animal. I'm going to breathe life into that flower because I know Adam will like that. God was creating something that Adam didn't know about. But he was going to rule over. Can I tell you that right now, it may look like there's nothing going on. But God is in the middle of creating some things that have never existed in the spirit realm. Don't for a minute let the enemy get you sidetracked into thinking that the earth is void. And darkness is upon the face of the deep. And the wicked are in control. And the devil's won. And the church is dead. Not so. It does It doesn't matter if it looks like nothing's going on. We got a God who quickens things which are dead. And he speaketh things that are not as though they are. He can do anything he wants to. Anytime he wants to. It doesn't matter what you need. God in a moment's time can say let it be. And out of the ashes something comes. We can't see it, but God right now is at work all over the earth. And he's speaking things that are not as though they are. And he's excited because he knows that that, hallelujah, which has been dead, is coming to life. And he's going to give it to him. And so the way God works is he never brought Adam on the scene, never brought him into creation until he had created everything that Adam would need. And in fact, Adam was created on the sixth day after everything else was done. Why? Part of it was God didn't want to be distracted by other things because he saved the best for last. He never, a flower never put God on his knees in the dirt. The beasts of the field never made God get on his knees. But when God decided to make man in his own image, it brought him to his knees. He got in the dirt. He began to shape. Michael's standing there looking on the edge of, over his shoulder, and Gabriel's watching him. They're going, what's he doing? I don't know, but 
it's starting to look like him. They ain't never seen this before. Hallelujah. They know what angels look like, but angels don't look like Jesus. But oh, hallelujah. And then God Almighty, he's the Father. He's just down there and he's shaping and he's got those hands of the artist and he's sculpturing. And when he got done, there lays this beautiful, perfect man laying in the dust. And then God got down, hallelujah. Got down and he looked at him. He put his mouth on his nose and, and he went. <laughs> and when he did that, Adam's eyes open. He didn't have to say, who are you? God had put in him the knowledge that when he opened his eyes, he said, Father. And Adam looked at him and said, oh, my Father. And Jesus, hallelujah, as the Word, gathered him up in his arms. And there was an embrace. And the Father said to Adam, everything you see, I made for you. God didn't really need a bird, a whale, a hippo, but he needed Adam. See, those things didn't excite God because they didn't come from his spiritual loins. They came from his creative ability. But Adam excited him. Because when God looked at Adam, he saw himself. There's something about a parent when they can look at their child and people will go, that kid looks just like you. Nobody goes, I hate that. <laughs> We're proud of that. And when God would look at Adam he was proud of that man, but he never brought Adam to existence until the very first complete day that Adam would ever live was the day of rest. On the seventh day, when Adam woke up, he woke up, and the Bible said that God had rested from his own works and he looked at everything and he said, it is good. And the first full day that man ever existed, God rested from his creative works so he could have fellowship with Adam. That he was not distracted by the other things, but the ultimate goal had always been, I want to hang out with my son. And that's why you find him in the cool of the day. And so, I hate death. Um, I hate seeing a dead deer alongside the road. It just, it just makes my heart sad. Um, I don't do well with death. When my father died, I was 12. I couldn't look at him. I never went in. And I hate to say this, I, I, I couldn't go look at Josh. I wanted to remember them, how they were. I think God wants to remember you and I alive and not dead. And see, the, what we're struggling with as a church in this nation and in the earth is there are so many things that have been precious to us that have died. You can't debate that. It's dead. There are things that have died. Morality has died. Sacredness has died. But the enemy came in and they killed normal things. And he went after the church in this nation. And by and large, he 
pretty much killed a, a, a large constituency of the church. Until now, there's just a form of godliness, but there isn't any power. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Listen, what makes our church different? We don't even have a building. Not yet. But I'll tell you what we do have. We have the presence of the Lord. I'll trade a, a great sanctuary any day. Put me in a tent. But I would be a, David, I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than dwell in the tents of the wicked. I thank God for what's coming. But it's not a building that makes us who we are. It's who's in the house. It's the God of resurrection and life. That's why Jesus said, I am not the God of the dead, but I am the God of the living. So without, I have no doubt that we can't see it yet. But God is in the middle of creating things right now in the atmosphere. That's why we get surges in prayer and we get surges in worship. And, and we, we have God, things are happening because we, we get that feeling that there's something happening in the spirit realm. And see, the enemy can't stop creation. Nowhere in the story of creation does it say, and on the third day, demons showed up, and Jesus had to, or God the Father had to go to battle and fight demons. That's right. They had already been defeated. Because out of all the things that God gave Adam, the greatest thing that he gave him was authority. He said, son, everything that you see is yours, and I give you authority. Why would he need authority? Because the enemy was present but didn't have any. And the devil had to use trickery through the serpent to get to Eve. But there was authority in the spirit realm of what you and I are sensing right now is the authority of the Holy Ghost. So now we go back... Uh, to the New Testament here, Romans chapter 4, and it tells the story of Abraham. And Abraham is one of the most extraordinary men that you will read about in the scriptures. But it's very interesting that when God got ready to birth a nation, he didn't pick a 20-year-old. He picked a 75-year-old man. And a 65-year-old wife that pretty much think everything is over. That if something's going to happen, in fact, Abraham is so convinced that he will never have children that he looked at Eliezer, his steward of his house, as someone that could, he could be in trust with what he had. But whenever God calls you from one place to another, he has purpose for you by the Spirit of the Lord. One of the reasons that there's a mandate on this house is that we have come from everywhere. I always like it when people say they're from Washington State because God brought me from Washington State to be here. I wasn't raised in the South. And yet God brought, he transplanted me here. And then you got people moving from all over the place that are coming together. What is that? That is a divine purpose of the Lord because right now there is a clarion call going out across the United States and other countries that says come to Nashville because there's something happening in the spirit realm by the power of the Lord and so they're coming from the north the south the east and the west and we call them the remnant because they are hungry for the things of God. and so right now in the in the natural realm the media says God is dead And I thought about this push that has been the last couple of years to remove the history of our nation 
And, and I, I totally understand why some statues, the African Americans want them removed or some other ethnicities. But I mean, they're removing statues that have nothing to do with racism. That's right. They have to do with the heritage of our nation. What is that? The devil is trying to tear down the memorials of who we are. And whenever you go after things that belong to God, God in kind will go after the devil, the same things that belong to him. And whenever you start tearing down memorials in our nation that represent righteousness, God is going to go after the memorials that the devil has that represent his heritage and Baal's coming down. Yeah. Hallelujah. I, I don't know how, but... I told the Lord, I don't see how there can ever be the end time harvest in Nashville, Tennessee until you hit the Parthenon and bring it to the ground with that 48-foot statue of Jezebel that's ruling over our city. Somewhere, God has to shake that thing until that idol falls down and bows at the name of Jesus. You can mark it down when Channel 5 has to report. We don't know what happened but their Parthenon is in the ground in rubbles and the thing is down. There is something going on in the spirit realm. There are some idols and God's going to shake. Did he not say, I'm going to shake everything that can be shaken. Oh, to strengthen those things which are removed. And God comes to him in his older age. He said, I'm making you a father of many nations. And he said, the child's going to come out of the womb of your wife. Well, it was possible. I mean, they lived a lot older back then. Abraham, he never died till he was 175. So he is not even middle age. <laughs> Think about that. He would have had to have been, um, what, 80, 85 and, or something like that, 87 to be middle age. So he's, he's still, you know, like for us, he's, he's like 35, 40 years old. And God says, you're going to be the father of many nations. How many feel like that God has made you some promises that you got years ago? And then you think, what, what about that? And we start thinking, did you forget? You know, because it's like 10 years now. I remember I was, uh, I was ministering in a morning service at uh, Regent University for CBN and... Um, I got done ministering, and, and there was a, an old, older man that came up to me, and he was, he, had, he was known as a prophet, and he took my hands, and he said, the Lord said to tell you that he's going to raise you up, and you're going to be a voice around the world, and it's going to happen so quick, and people are going to pull on you from everywhere, and to be careful who you line yourself up with, and I'm thinking, right. Because I got calendars where I'm, you know, five weeks without a meeting. Nobody knows me. And I'm just, we're, you know, we're struggling to make ends meet. We're driving an old van and we're living in an apartment. But when God makes you a promise, a lot of times he does it in a, in a position, a posture, to where it takes faith to get a hold of it. Because in the natural, it doesn't exist. But see, God is a God who speaketh things that are not as though they are. And I had forgotten about that prophecy until recently. And I told my wife, I said, you remember what that guy told me? And I said, everything he said happened. And it happened just like he said, overnight. And I thought, only God could have done that. But the weird part is... It took over 30 years for that prophetic word to come to pass. 
but I would hold on, hallelujah, to what God said. Some of you, the enemy has convinced you that because it looks like it's dead, it cannot happen. But don't you know he is the God who quickens things which are dead? If you've been listening to us in the last month, we've been talking some about the anointing of Elijah. And I really believe that there is an Elijah anointing on the church right now because that's the only anointing that can break this spirit of Jezebel that's ruling in our nation. But in that setting, when God finished with Elijah, the devil could not kill him. He went up in a rapture. When God is finished with the church over the next few years, we are not going to be decimated and die, but we're going to go up in a rapture according to the scripture, and we are going to complete what God has called us to do. When you go back to the Old Testament, I was just reflecting and I, I, I might be off here, but I think if I'm right, there were only three people raised from the dead. All of them because of the Elijah anointing. The first one was raised from the dead by Elijah, the widow's son. The next one was raised from the dead was Elisha who went in the house, remember, sent Gehazi ahead of him, and, and Gehazi said he ain't moving, and Elisha went in. But what does Elisha have? He has a double portion of Elijah anointing. And the third time somebody's raised from the dead, what happens is Elijah and Elisha are, are gone. Elijah's gone. Elisha's dead. And a soldier gets killed in the battle, and they're in a hurry. And what do they do? They throw him in an open grave, and he hits the bones of Elijah or Elisha. And the Bible said he came up out of the grave alive and well. So in the Old Testament, because Elijah could not die, God had loosed an Elijah anointing. And wherever there is an Elijah anointing, there is resurrection on the way because you cannot kill what God speaks life into. And one of the mistakes that a lot of us have made over the years is what we saw die, we thought was our purpose and didn't realize it was our seat. You need to get a hold of this. God always puts seed in the ground. And planting is associated with crying. He that goeth forth weeping, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again rejoicing, not bringing his seed back with him, but bringing his sheaves with him. And sometimes what we think is our purpose, the mature purpose of God in our life is not. It is the seed of what we're going to enter into. So you have to go through a dying process because God has to take the seed of your potential and put it in the ground. This church would not have existed if resting place had not been planted in the soil of faith. And the enemy cannot kill the seed. You could take a seed. Even scientists have said they have found seeds that are over 2,000 years old in tombs and planted them and they begin to bring forth life. It doesn't matter how long the enemies planted you in the ground of disappointment. When God says it's resurrection, you are coming out of the soil. He cannot stop you because the power of Elijah is upon you and there is an ability to rise up in the Holy Ghost. May God release, hallelujah, a understanding that we are in resurrection season. We are not in death. We are not dying. The enemy will not bury us, but we're coming up out of the grave. We might be going a little while today. I don't know. 
So every powerful person in history, when you read about them, they have a story where it looks like it was over. Doesn't matter if it's Wigglesworth or John G. Lake or Finney or any of them. Kenneth Hagin, they all went through a season where it looked like it was over. And then God breathes resurrection life on the seed. And what comes out of the ground is not what went in the ground. Hallelujah. What comes out of the ground is all the potential that was locked up in the seed. But the seed had to die so it could break open and God releases out of that soil everything that you were born to do. There is so much in some of you today and those of you that listen to me around the world, you don't know it, but you are already in the middle of the house breaking on your seed and you're coming out of the soil and the devil's going to look at you and wish he would have never buried you. I can promise you the devil should have left resting place alone because this wouldn't have happened. He should have left some of you alone when he drug you to hell and back and thought you would throw in the towel. You came out of your grave triumphant in the glory and in the power of God. And you are not who you used to be, but you are more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ who resurrected you. God always waits until it looks impossible. Resurrection always happens in the impossible. You think about Jesus. He said this. He said, no man can kill me. He said, you don't take my life. Pilate said, don't you know I have the power over you? He said, you don't have any power except the Father gives you. He said, no man takes my life. He said, I lay it down. And he said, I can take it back up. And when, see, everything that God does has to come out of the death process. Because that's where man's ability to take credit for it dissipates. You can't take credit for something that died. And then God begins to do something. You'll notice on the day of Pentecost, nobody stood up and said, that was me. (laughs) They didn't even know what they were waiting for. And I think they probably were discouraged. All they know is God said, just hang out there. They didn't understand the prophetic feast. They didn't understand they were between Pentecost or between um, Feast of First Fruits or all the way back to the waving of the sheaves and Pentecost. They didn't realize that. If they had it, they'd have understood that there's something getting ready to happen. But the Bible says when the day of Pentecost was fully come, The Father did not pour the glory out in that room simply because there were 120 people there. He poured it out because his word had to be fulfilled. And on the day of Pentecost, hallelujah, that's what Joe prophesied. There are some things that are going to happen prophetically in the nation that will not be brought about by prayer and fasting. They're going to be fulfilled because God said it and he cannot lie. Hell can't stop it. Man can't stop it. Denominations can't stop it. The media can't stop it. The Supreme Court can't outlaw it. It's just God saying, I said it. It's going to happen because my word word will not return unto me void. (laughs) Hallelujah. There's something in the spirit right now. And you and I, it's almost like the church right now, it's just laying in limbo. We don't have any idea that God is already in the middle of creating things. And Jesus was not put to death. Now, I know it looks like he was, but the Bible said he laid down his life. He never gave in to death 
until he said these words. It is finished. Everything that I'm supposed to have done, I have done. And he said, I think I'm just going to lay down for three days now. Because that's what he said. I laid down my life. He went and laid down in the tomb. You know what he did? He rested. And on the third day, the enemy couldn't take his life, so they had no control over it. And on the third day, hallelujah, the word said, I think I'll get up now. And the eyes opened on the natural man of Christ because the word said it was time to get up. And when the word moved inside, God manifested in flesh. Jesus got back up. This had nothing to do with the devil at the beginning. It had nothing to do with the devil at resurrection. It had to do with the prophetic word of the Lord. And Jesus got up because he said, I got some stuff now I need to do. And for 40 days he hung out with him, tell him, you got no idea what's getting ready to happen and on the day of Pentecost suddenly, hallelujah I'm telling you, we don't know when it's going to happen, we might not even be having church, all of a sudden our iPhones go crazy did you hear this, did you hear that, what is it it's a reversal, what happened God spoke a word over the earth, over the nations and declared, I am quickening those things which were dead and I'm speaking things that are are not and so they are God picked Abraham because he knew he had faith he knew he had faith because he told him he said get out of where you live leave your house your father everybody and Abraham left and they asked him they said well, why are you leaving what are you looking for he said I don't know he said but I know when I see it because I'm looking for a city that has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. And God looked down in heaven, looked at Gabriel and said, that's him right there. Went down and told him, said, told the angel, go tell him he's going to have a boy. And it's going to be like the sand of the seashore. And whenever, you know, whenever God gives you a prophetic word, you know, a lot of times it's very powerful. You're thinking, my God, it'll probably happen the next couple hours. I mean, it felt like that, you know. <laughs> Bless God, he heard me. It's going to happen, you know, next week. It'll all be over. And, and um, when God told that to Abraham, him and Sarah sitting around, because her womb ain't dead, and his loins ain't dead, because in their day, they were still young enough to have children. And God looked down and he said, but what I'm birthing in them, they don't know, but it's called faith. And he said, it has to be tested. And he said, what I'm going to birth is going to be miraculous. I'm going to speak something that has never been. No woman 90 has ever had a healthy baby, let alone a baby. This, it's, it's never happened. And they're sitting around in the tent, and they're talking about, can you believe it? God said, we're going to have a baby. I'm so excited, you know. Here I am, baby. I'm 75 years old, and I get to be a father. And she's talking about where we're going to make the, the little nursery. And they're getting baby stuff together, and they're excited. And God's up there going, bless their hearts. They have no idea what's getting ready to go through. Because a year later, she ain't pregnant. Two years later, she's not pregnant. Five years. Now, the nursery has dust on it. Ten years has went by, and I'm sure Sarah doesn't even want to go in there anymore. Who wants to look at an empty bassinet that you thought would have been filled with joy long, long time ago. <clears throat> a lot of times, God will let us reach a place to where 
just for our own sanity, we don't think too much about the promises we got. Because it, it disheartens. And see, that's in between <clears throat> the promise <clears throat> and the fulfillment enters another character into the narrative called unbelief. Because unbelief, this is very interesting. Nobody believes God more than the demon of unbelief. And the reason the demon of unbelief goes after you because he knows better than anybody if God said it, he's going to do it. So unbelief shows up and starts speaking the opposite of everything that God has said because he knows if he can keep you from coming to an agreement with what God has said, there is a cohabitation that takes place and life called faith brings forth the promise. God Whenever he's going to do something that affects the destiny of nations, he waits until there is no possible way in the natural world for it to ever happen. We are there. I was just reading, uh, I think maybe in Timothy where Paul begins to talk about what society will be like before God comes back. Unthankful, unmerciful, hateful, backbiters, murderers, adulterers, disobedient to parents, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having the form of God but no power thereof, the... Uh, um, lasciviousness and, and the, the list goes on and on we are there nobody ever thought that the society that we live in would have ever reached this place we, and that's where the world comes to God is setting the stage just like when the Lord made preparation for Adam to walk into the Garden of Eden and rule and reign, he had to repair the darkness and misery, the sorrow, the destruction that was on the earth. There has to be a place where God steps in and begins to say, let there be light and there shall be light in the evening time. He's 80, he's 85, his faith got a little weak, he births an Ishmael, but God isn't buying into Ishmael. We birthed an Ishmael for a few years in this nation. We had all kinds of fake stuff and fake healings and prosperity, and God was just about money and jets and houses and planes and all of that, and God said, that's not me, that's man-made. He said, I got an Isaac in the womb of a house of a Lord, and when this boy comes out of the womb, he is going to be greater than what anything man can ever come up with. Oh, may God baptize you with an Isaac anointing that comes out of a supernatural resurrection of the Spirit of the Lord. And as great as Abraham was, God said this. He said, I'm going to wait until his loins die. And I'm going to wait till her womb is dead. And you say, well, how do you know that? Because the scripture I read to you, it said he no longer would consider the fact that his loins were dead, nor consider the fact that his wife's womb was dead. Just because... The natural means dies for God to perform something doesn't mean the promise dies. It's not contingent, hallelujah, on any of the things that we see that we have looked to for hope. It is contingent on the fact that God cannot lie. And his word says, I'm coming back for a glorious church without spot, wrinkle, or
or blemish and the gospel shall be preached unto all nations and then the end shall be. You can't stop it. You can't stomp it out. You can't outlaw it. You can't kill it. There is an end time move of the Lord rapidly on its way. It's coming out of the throne room of the holiest of holies. It's going to turn the world upside down. It's going to save your children and heal your body. And there's nothing that hell can do about it. Hallelujah. Oh, do you feel that in your spirit? What is that? There's something stirring in your womb. Till he's 99. And she is 79. Well, she... Yeah, she's going, she's getting ready to turn 90. She's 89. And the most astounding part of this narrative is Abraham would sit and look at Sarah and go, I don't know how, but I still believe we're going to have a baby. God, look at him. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Hallelujah. When his womb, his, the womb was dead, the loins were dead, the body was old and decrepit. There wasn't any hope in the natural. Everybody thought they were crazy, but they didn't empty out the nursery. Oh. Hallelujah. Until one day God looked down. And he said, <clears throat> I think it's time. And he sent a boat of resurrection and hit him. He got a spark in his eye, and she got a spark in her eye, and there are 99 and 89, and something happened. And when it happened, God put life, something went up that fallopian tube. Hallelujah. And God said, watch this. Hallelujah. And all of a sudden, after 25 years, God, who quickens things which are dead, before the baby was ever formed, the Holy Ghost reached back down into a 90-year-old woman, touched her womb, made it like a 16-year-old on the inside, touched the old boy, hallelujah, Abraham, and the next thing you know, everything is like when the promise was given. Can I tell you, say it, the Lord, I'm going to reverse some things in this hour. I'm going to give back to you what died. I'm going to tell you you need to get ready there is a resurrection life get ready to happen in the Holy Ghost it doesn't matter how long it's been buried it don't matter how old you are it doesn't matter how impossible it is if God said it it is coming out of the grave you can't kill faith And all of a sudden, after all of those years, this hundred-year-old man staggered not. When the Bible says, when there was nothing left to hope for, everything is gone. May God help our brothers and sisters who've thrown in the towel. Because we've all done that at some point in our life. May the Lord, hallelujah, loose across the earth right now a Abraham anointing that says, all I know is God said it, and I'm not looking anymore to men, but I'm looking to the holiest of holies because the Lord is going to bring it out. <clears throat> Listen, when, when Jesus got up after three days of rest, 
And in that first 24 hours, you know, he ascended into heaven. He put his blood on the mercy seat. And forever the Father accepted the propitiation for our sins. Jesus came back down the same evening. In a 12-hour period, he did all this. At the beginning, he said, don't touch me because he's a priest and he couldn't be defiled. And then that evening, he comes back down. He says, handle me. Why? Because he has completed. And the moment that death is not, Jesus didn't have to conquer death because death had never conquered him. There was never a moment where the devil was going to keep Jesus in the grave. It was prophesied. Even he said it. Destroy this temple, and in three days, I'm raising it back up. <clears throat> so it was, there wasn't a battle there. The issue was there was a spirit of death that ruled over humanity. And even as great as the Old Testament saints were, they still died and were buried. But when Jesus, hallelujah, who named himself, he said, I am resurrection. In fact, in Genesis, it says God called things out. He would say, let there be light. And there was light. In Romans, it says, and God called those things which are not as though they were. What was he doing then? He was calling things as he did in Genesis. I hear a calling of the Spirit of the Lord over the nations, over Canada, over India. Hallelujah. It doesn't matter over England. And the Lord is saying, let there be harvest, harvest, harvest. And all that the enemy had buried, when resurrection came out of the grave, he said, I believe I'll get some of my buddies up with me. And the Bible said he messed up the graveyard in Jerusalem. They just opened up. And out came all these Old Testament saints he was quickening the dead. If God can empty a graveyard out in the eastern gates of Jerusalem and bring Old Testament saints out that have been dead three and four thousand years and they look perfectly normal and they're walking the streets of Jerusalem. Don't you think God can do anything he wants in the year 2022? It doesn't matter that we, the church doesn't have a national media voice like CNN or Facebook or all of those things. We already have a voice whose voice, hallelujah, he said, my voice will shake the earth. God isn't going to stand over the edge of glory and say, it's time, shake, and everything will begin to shake. Everything will begin to move. You don't see it, but right now the Lord says, I am creating things in the atmosphere because I am getting ready. When 2023 hits, the graves are going to open, says the Lord, over the house of God, and we're coming out of what the enemy did to us, and that it's going to be a resurrection revival of the power of God sweep across the earth. Keep on standing. And we end this passage, which I read to you. Said the reason this happened is because Abraham was fully persuaded that what God had promised he was also able to perform. There is a weeding process right now that God's letting happen. Yep. And there's too many people that weren't fully persuaded. Yep. They needed the media to tell them it was going to work. <clears throat> or a government to tell them. I told the devil the other day, I said, I can't hear you because the word is speaking too loud.
I'm hearing too loud what God has already said. I can't hear what the devil's saying right now. Hallelujah. Harabobobo Sunday. Praise God. Praise God. Lord, I loose right now in this building brand new things that don't exist. They've never existed. We loose them over this congregation all around the world. Every nation that was named today that my wife called out. Every state. God, we speak things that are not, hallelujah, as though they already were. And Lord, I also declare that there is a resurrection, hallelujah, that God is raising up. You're quickening the dead in Jesus' name. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Two things I believe that the Lord will do for many of you. Some gifts <clears throat> and abilities that were in your life when you were young that died out. <clears throat> I believe that God is going to resurrect them. And then there are many of you that have never moved in some of the gifts that God's getting ready to do. I pastored for, I preached for 15 years before I ever moved prophetically. And then one day, God just out of the blue. And when he gave it to me, I didn't know what it was. When I was prophesying, I didn't know how it was working. It was just a gift that God said it was time. There are some gifts that God has your name on. And you gotta start believing, hallelujah. Do not let your past Declare your future. The Bible says about uh, Sarah, you know, she, she laughed. The angel said, why did Sarah laugh? She said, oh, I, I wasn't laughing. She said, oh, you laughed. But then when she was holding that baby, she said, God has made me laugh again. And this time it wasn't unbelief. It was the joy of holding a promise that took 25 years in the making. And she holds the Guinness Book of World Records for being the oldest woman to ever have a baby. many of you under the sound of my voice <clears throat> that God's going to knock the dust off of your nursery of dreams and you're going to hold in your life what man said was impossible. How many believe that? How many would tell the Lord today whatever you want to do with me, it's all right with me. Oh, God, use us, Lord. Hallelujah. Doesn't matter how old you are, your education level, your financial status, whether you're married, you're single, or you're widowed, or you're divorced, it's your heart that God is breathing on right now. Can you feel it? There is a wind resurrection that's flowing through this sanctuary right now in the spirit of the Lord go ahead and receive it just right where you're at right now I want, I want you just to tell the Lord God I'm receiving this whatever it is and I can promise you we're not going to have to wait 25 years this time this is a quick work that God is doing We've already put in our 25 years. Right now, some of you are feeling a stirring in your spirit womb. You know what that is? That's Isaac kicking. <clears throat> hallelujah. There's an Isaac trying to kick inside your womb. You're going, what is this? This is that. Hallelujah. That God said, I am quickening those sayings which are dead. Jeff, I'll just loose a whole new dimension on your life. 
Parabobobo Sunday. So many of you in this building, my God, I feel the love of the Father. Right now, I believe that God Almighty is on his knees and he is blowing. Psalm says he kisses me, or Song of Psalm, he kisses me with the kisses of his mouth. I believe God's getting ready to kiss his bride. Someday. As you're coming, those that are wanting me to pray for you, if you find your way over to this side here, come on, church. There's a, we've, we've stepped over the last few weeks into another realm. Come with me and let's stand right up front because we're going to posture ourselves today to receive the word of the Lord. 